Thanks, brothers. Proverbs 4.23 is one of the most important verses in the Old Testament for New Covenant life. And Romans 12.1 is uh, what I wanted to share about today, message based on that. And, uh, and also Romans 12.2 ties into that. And so I'll just read Romans 12.1 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. One, one thing the, the Lord is showing me recently is that every circumstance that happens uh, in my life, it's the equivalent of God saying, this is my will for you right now. And maybe it's a result of my actions, maybe it's not, maybe it's a consequence of something I did, maybe it's not, maybe it's a closed door, maybe it's an open door, maybe it's a difficult door, maybe it's a painful door, maybe it's the only open door, um, maybe we're at a spot where there's three open doors in front of us, but we're just in, waiting right now in front, not sure where to go, or maybe all the doors are closed and we're stopped with nowhere to go, um, but whatever it is, uh, it's the, the exact equivalent of God saying, this spot that you're in right now is my will for you right now with regard to my circumstances. And when I saw that, uh, and as I've seen that, discipleship and carrying my cross to follow Jesus, it becomes a lot clearer how to walk with God every day and a lot easier too. And I wanted to share a quick story about two men, both who are Christians, and the, the thing about these men is they had exactly the same day, the same circumstances uh, in their day. But um, I want to talk, share about them and their day and then also how their day was different. So the first man, it's early in the morning, and he woke up right away and he said a prayer. God, please help me to have a good day today. And he got up and he went over to take a shower. And the hot water heater was out, out and there was no hot water. So he kind of sighed and grunted, and he skipped the shower, and he just washed his face with cold water. Uh, so he went downstairs, and he made coffee, and he spilled some on his pants, and he complains to himself, murmurs to himself that he has to go change his pants now. Now he's running late for work. On the way to work, he gets stopped behind a long train, which cause, he, it does cause him to be late for work, and so he's driving angry now and frustrated. He walks in, and the boss sees him walking in late and makes a comment. Let's try to be a little more punctual, huh? And he half nods and half ignores him out of frustration. Uh, <clears throat> and he texts his wife, I'm having the worst day. She replies, you left your lunch here. And he grunts with anger and again and texts her back, why couldn't you remind me? Thanks a lot. Now I have to buy lunch. Uh, things continue like this through the day. He gets an email. There's a big problem with the project he's working on. And he has to work really late today to get it done. Then in the middle of the day, someone emails him for help with some other small thing. But because of his frustration, he's annoyed, so he responds with a short answer. Uh, you should be able to find some help on Google there for that. Uh, so this keeps continuing all day through the night. And when he finally, he, he keeps going on, he finally lays down that night on, in bed, back in bed. He's in a bad mood, hoping the next day will be different. But he knows it won't be. Uh, every day for him is like this to some degree or another. A lot of things go wrong constantly and because it's true what Jesus said at the very end of Matthew 6, each day has enough trouble of its own. <laughs> so have you ever had a day like that? I think pretty much all of us every day is like that to some extent or another. Not our response necessarily, but the day itself where there's some things go right, some things go wrong. Um, but here's the, the story, the man number two. He is um, also a Christian, and he has exactly the same circumstances happen. Uh, but listen to this story and how he starts the day. So this man, number two, wakes up just like the first man. The first thing he does was he said a prayer, but his prayer was different. He said, Father, help me to do your will today. So from there, God actually answered and started speaking to him. He said, God said, okay, I'll help you. 
So he was, this man now was actually in a, a mode of listening to God and wanting to obey him. And so God was actually able to speak to him. So here's how the day went from there. He walked over to the shower to take a shower, but God says, don't shower today. Just wash your face with cold water. He says, okay, Father. He goes downstairs, makes some coffee, and he's not sure why, but God says, go change your pants. <laughs> and right at the same moment, he spill, spills coffee on his pants, and he knows why God said that. And so he does it with contentment. Uh, <clears throat> on the road, he's going to work now, and God says to him, I specifically had you not take the lunch your wife today, that your, um, your wife packed for you today. You're going to buy your lunch today. He doesn't know why, but he says, okay, Lord, that's fine. He drives to work and is running late, but God says, I'm sitting in train your way. You're going to show up late today. Wait patiently for the train to pass. He says, okay, Father. He walks into work, and as he's walking in, God says, I'm sending your boss your way. He's going to correct you for being late. Accept the correction and apologize. He says, okay, Lord, I'm sorry. Um, and he says to his boss, I'm sorry, boss. I'll try to leave earlier next time. Okay. So his wife texts him that he left his lunch at home. And he says, yes, thanks. Can you please put it in the fridge? I'll take it tomorrow. God says to him, I want you to work late today and extra hard on your project. He says, okay, Father. Then he gets an email about this big issue, and so he's working on it. And God says, someone is about to email you now with an issue that's only going to take one minute to fix. Uh, go ahead and do that. Go ahead and help them. And he says, yes, Daddy, no problem. So the day continued on like this. And at the end of the day, he laid down in bed. But he didn't have a bad mood. He was in a good mood. Uh, he thanked the Lord for the day, and he was able to sleep with very restfully. <laughs> the end. Okay, uh, both men had exactly the same day, the same circumstances, outwardly. But why is the first man's life really bad? He's angry, unhappy, and the second man's life is restful and peaceful and joyful. What was the difference? And I think the difference was the bed that they woke up on. When God looked down on, in, from heaven, the first man, he was laying on a nice, soft, cozy bed. And that's what he wanted for his day. But when God looked down from heaven at the second man, he didn't see this man on a nice, cozy bed. He saw the man, like it says in Romans 12, 1, laying on an altar. And the second man woke up on an altar. And it reminded me of when... Um, when God looked down and he must have seen Isaac laying on the altar when Abraham says, go up there, I have to kill you now. And Isaac gets up on the altar and Abraham is about to kill him. And he willingly laid down before his dad there. And that was basically the life of the second man. That's how he lived. He lived like Isaac who willingly laid down on the altar, just like in Romans 12, 1 here it says, present your body a living sacrifice. That was how he would live throughout the day. He basically had the attitude of, I exist for God. I'm here to serve God and do his will. That's, that's it. Uh, and that's how Jesus was. He, Jesus said the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served. It's like what it says in Romans 12.1 there. And that's how, so that's how the man woke up, and that's how he lived every day. The first man woke up saying, God, please give me a good day. I, I don't think I'm alone in saying I, I've prayed this uh, prayer <laughs> many times. Um, but it's different uh, than the, what the second man prayed. The, the second man was saying, Father, I exist for you. Help me to just hear you and do your will today. His, in his mind, he probably had words like Psalm 119, verse 11. Your word I've treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. Maybe he had Matthew 4, 4 in his mind. I live on every word that proceeds from God's mouth. So the first man went to bed frustrated with life, and the second man was at rest all the time. Uh, the first man, he had expectations on God, and that's why he was always let down. That's why life was bad. Uh, and that's why he didn't have joy. And he wasn't um, rejoicing in what God had given him. He had so much ex other expectations, and so his faith was very weak. But the second man had great faith. He was depending on God, and he was confident that even God, when God didn't give him what he want, that wanted, that was the best plan, uh, even if he didn't know why it was the best plan. And the first man doubted in God's love because of how difficult his life was every day. He started doubting in God himself. But the second man, he was so confident in God's love that he was basically, his attitude, he, one of his favorite verses was, 
what Job said, even if he slays me, my hope is in him. Uh, so that's why the first man didn't hear God, but the second man had a very clear ear to hear what God was saying all the time, and he was able to get through everything with rest. And so basically I just share that story because I, I felt it helped me to think about how different my life is when I change my mind from my will be done to God's will be done. That's how different the same circumstances, but a life can be. And the person who says your will be done is a listening person. It's like a, a Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. God's always speaking to them and giving them needs for every circumstance. And they see every circumstances from God. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say yes, daddy, to everything, whatever comes. And that second man, it says here in Romans 12, 1, he was a worshiper. But the first man was a spiritual baby. So, um, yeah, the, I've, I've seen that a lot of times when I think of obedience. I learned that word pretty early on in my Christian life. I think of obedience as one of the most um, important words that every Christian needs to learn. Children need to know it when they're young. Uh, but when I've thought of obedience, I usually thought of don't do bad things. Don't murder. Don't steal. Uh, but how often does that come up? Don't murder people. Eh, it's pretty easy to not do every day. Don't steal things. Okay. Uh, but I think 99% of discipleship is saying, okay, Lord, to every circumstance that comes, just like that, um, that the story of the men. It's basically saying, yes, Father, and responding to it in the way that he tells me to. That's most of life. Um, it's not, don't kill people, don't lie, don't steal. Um, that sometimes comes up, but most of the time it's saying, yes, Lord, yes, Daddy, uh, and then responding to it how he tells me to. Um, and so it helps me to think of obedience like that. And I've struggled with frustration recently, and, at, and this has kind of helped me, just seeing all of my circumstances as directly coming from God's hand. And it changes everything because I know he loves me, and if I'm like the second man, I don't need to know the purpose. Um, I, I just know that if a circumstance comes, it's equivalent to God saying, don't do this, do this, don't go this way, go that way. This is how it's going to be, so I want you to respond like this. And, and I think that's basically what Jesus meant. Um, it, to me, that's the way I take when Jesus told the disciples, watch and pray. He, he told that to his disciples, I think it's in Matthew 26, when the they were falling asleep. They were tempted to fall asleep and not carry the burden with Jesus. And um, Jesus said, watch and pray so that you don't enter into temptation. And I think the way I can take it for myself with relation to this is watch for whatever thing God is giving me with his hand right now and be ready for it to say, yes, daddy, I'll obey. To be eager to obey in that. Watch and pray in every little thing and whatever. watch for whatever come, is coming my way saying, God sent this. And see what God says about it. It's because along with the circumstance, a lot of times God gives us a word with the circumstance. But I think for myself, I've missed the word a lot of times and only seen the circumstance. But I think a lot of times, if we're eager for it, a lot of times God will give us the circumstance along with the word that will carry us in the circumstance. And so, um, yeah, I see, I see that this is discipleship. Uh, spirituality isn't waking up at 4 a.m. every day reading the Bible. <laughs> It's dying to my will like this in the little things every day saying, yes, Father, I'm going to respond um, how you want me to. And uh, it's, not, it's not like a child saying, no, why? No, I don't want this. <laughs> Cringing, but it's saying, yes, Daddy. And, um, and so, yeah, that, that really helped me. And one, one, one thing I wanted to say about this was also to notice one other difference about these two men was how they treated other people. Uh, and this was also hit home for me thinking about this recently. It was a lesson God's emphasizing to me in this point. It's regarding kindness. Look at how the two men treated others, the, the boss, the wife. Uh, the frustrations of the first man, he took out on other people. And the second, but the second man was very patient and kind to his wife, to his coworkers. And recently I saw um, that when I had a lot of frustrations in the day, if I didn't get my way in a lot of little, little tiny things, my tendency was to be a little unkind or short with other people. And 
I'm not sure if my coworkers may have been able to tell the, the short tone in my emails, but I'm pretty sure my family could tell, even if I wasn't yelling at them, but maybe just subtle, subtle unkindness. The smile was lost, maybe. The, the encouragement or the thought of doing stuff for them was lost. And, and so along with this exhortation to overcome my own will, uh, I've also, the Lord is also giving me a challenge how important plain and simple kindness is. And it's not a word I thought of, I've thought of much, being kind. <clears throat> I was at the grocery store yesterday, and um, I was walking down the aisle, and most, this, the Bay Area is a pretty big place, millions of people, most people don't interact with each other, they just go about their business. But there was this one older man that passed me along the aisle, and he smiled very warmly, maybe warmer than I've ever seen, and he just said hello. And it was so nice, <laughs> just, I don't know whether this guy was a Christian, maybe he was. But I felt like it just lifted my mood a little bit. <laughs> and I thought, how much more should my mood be lifted when I see that God is smiling at me all the time? <laughs> and then I thought one other thing, which how much more should I be smiling at people with a warmth like that and lifting them? And uh, we have in the church, we've learned there's much more than just warm smiles we can give. There's prophetic words of encouragement and comfort based in God's word that we can give. And hopefully we take advantage of that. Um, but I, I think that is, for, for me personally, that's been one of the most neglected things. It's just plain and simple kindness. <laughs> and I see how important it is to Jesus when in Mark 3, 5, it says that he looked with anger at cruel people who were being mean to, uh, they were basically judging and there was a man with a withered hand, it says there. And they were so cruel that they were hoping that Jesus wouldn't heal this man because it was a... Uh, um, a Sabbath, I believe that's what the was, and that's why they were going to judge and be um, hard-hearted. He, and he said Jesus looked at anger because of their hard-heartedness. He looked at them with anger to see that's how important kindness is and mercy, plain and simple kindness and care for other people. Um, and yeah, as disciples, I, I, I see I can't forget that because there's a saying, you can lose the forest for the trees. It, there, that's a, a saying that it's similar to when Jesus said you, to the Pharisees, you strain out gnats and swallow camels. And in other words, you lost the main point of everything and you're focusing on such little unimportant things. Even children know that they should be kind. Um, but a lot of times looking at the little rules of religion and verses and things like this, uh, we can miss plain things just to be kind to people. And we can read devotional books and be mean to people in our home right afterwards. And kind of like religious robots. Uh, I'm, I'm a Christian with religion. Uh, but somewhere along the line, maybe we've lost a heart, a God's heart. And we have to repent of that and uh, become a person again. Get, he said they were hard-hearted. They didn't have hearts anymore. They were hard-hearted. They were like robots. But we have to repent and be to have Christianity but with a heart uh, of love and and. That's exactly what the Bible says when it talks about the definition in 1 Corinthians 14 of love, describes love. <clears throat> the first two things, the, we heard of recently, Sandeep said, love is patient. The word after that is love is kind. But the four, what do the four verses before that say? I'll, I'll just paraphrase them. Don't lose the forest for the trees. <laughs> If I speak with the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have a gift of prophecy and know all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to move mountains but don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but don't have love, it profits me nothing. <clears throat> don't lose the forest for the trees. <laughs> Don't lose the, the main point of this life. The greatest command is to love God with all your heart. Um, love, love other people. And so that's the, the twofold thing that God is teaching me. To embrace with contentment all that God has for me. And embrace with kindness and mercy and love every person that he placed in my life. <clears throat> uh, not just embracing discipleship, but embracing discipleship with mercy and love and kindness and every day to be gentle to um, and kind to my spouse my kids patient with co-workers am i making so many demands on people lording it over my wife and kids 
Am I being short with coworkers when I'm in a bad mood? Are we kind to our spouse, helping them? Husbands, are you kind to your wife? Or do you make a lot of, so many demands? The Bible says, husbands, love your wives and give yourselves for them. I think for a lot of us husbands, we can translate that verse like this. Husbands, help your wives. Uh, <clears throat> serve in the home. Uh, wives, are you kind to your husbands, being a help? Or do you make so many demands on them? Do you question everything they say, decisions? And Does your spouse have to walk on eggshells in secret because they're afraid to get in an argument with you? I know, I know a man who, um, he liked to keep his trees really pruned and trimmed in the backyard, but his wife didn't like that. So he had to, um, he walked past the back door all the time with a saw hidden on the side of his leg. <laughs> so his wife wouldn't see him walking past and he'd go <laughs> trim the trees off, uh, branches off. <clears throat> it, uh, he was, it's, it's funny, he could have just let the tree grow. But I think the point is, uh, do, do we have to walk on eggshells around our spouse because we did, um, we feel like there's going to be arguments and heated uh, discussions. Kids, are you kind to your brothers and sisters? Do you share your things? <clears throat> God is watching. He's watching and hoping that you play together nicely. Uh, I remember uh, my kids the other day, they were having some discussion over whose, was, <laughs> whose thing was something. And usually I correct them by saying, you should share, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. But this time I didn't. I just said one thing. I want to tell you, God is actually here with us right now. He's in the car with us, you know. <laughs> and that's pretty much all I said. And then they said, they did, I didn't even have to correct them. He, they just said, I'm sorry <laughs> to each other. <laughs> uh, we sing that song, be careful little eyes what you see for your father up ahead, above is looking down with love. When we see God is really there, we should, we'll want to be kind because he's kind. So, uh, yeah, these are, these are things, very practical things. Kindness is practical. Kindness is keeping a good mood even if you don't feel like it. <laughs> uh, kindness is affirmation, assurance. Things will be okay. Don't, Jesus, God gave that to us. Don't worry. I love you. I'll take care of you. Uh, kindness is listening patiently to people even if they're taking too long to say what they need to say. <laughs> Kindness is giving my attention to others, not half-occupied half on something else while they're talking to me, continuing to glance down at my phone. Or Kindness is giving others time. If someone asks me for a favor, do I sigh? Yeah, I guess I can do that. Or do I do it with a cheerful heart? Of course I'd like to help you. Kindness is consideration. It's gratitude. It's appreciating uh, the good without focusing on the bad. Philippians 4, 8 says, whatever is worthy of praise, dwell on those things. What can I appreciate somebody for? One thing I've realized I can appreciate every person in my life for, there's one reason we can appreciate even the most difficult person in our life. Because so, God chose to put that person in my life. Like they're, The reason why they're there is because that's what God chose. They chose that person for me in my life, even for that little bit of time. Kindness is uh, joking and playing with our kids, having a cheerful smile. So that, I think that's how Jesus lived on earth. It's, uh, it's discipleship, but why do we carry our cross? It's for, for love, the sake of love, because we love God and we love other people. That's why there's people that, religious people that sleep on cold ground. They don't sleep on beds. They don't use, maybe they don't use their heater and things like that because they're having some really uh, stern religion. That's, that's fine, but what is the purpose of it <laughs> is the question. And the purpose of all our Christianity should be love. And, um, and so God is showing that radiate love, radiate kindness, plain and simple kindness. Um, it says about, that's how God saved us. Romans 2, 4, God, the kindness of God leads us to repentance. And I pray for my kids' salvation consistently. Uh, but I also see that what I need to work on more is kindness. Um, can they be led to repentance by kindness? Is my environment at home warm? Am I making it a warm environment? Or is it cold? Uh, uh, for around a one year, there were things inside of our fridge that kept freezing, and I didn't know why. Uh, sometimes the milk would have ice in it, and sometimes things would be, if they were at the top of the fridge, would be frozen. And I tried different things. I was like, I never really thought about it. But then I said, I wonder if the temperature is set too low. And so then I Googled how to change the temperature, and that sure enough, that was it. Uh, the environment was too cold, and so things were becoming hard and I had to set it warmer. 
A cold fridge makes frozen milk and a cold environment makes hard hearts. So my goal is to be warm uh, and to make the home a warm place. Uh, can I warm the people I'm with with a smile, the family, um, hearts, uh, that people that run into, can we bless them even if they're with us for two minutes? And so uh, just like to, to end with one Old Testament verse actually that's related in Micah. It's Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Micah 6, <clears throat> verse 8. One of, this is one of the greatest verses, I think, of the Old Testament, which summarizes how God wants me to live. It's also alluding to disciple, the life of a disciple. It's, it's helped me to think about things simply. <clears throat> Micah 6, 8. He's told you, O man, what is good, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Do justice. That's righteousness. It's Christ-likeness. Uh, to live like Jesus. And then to love kindness. Because righteousness without kindness and mercy is a dead, is dead religion, uh, like the Pharisees had. Um, and then to walk humbly with God. Humility, humility, humility. So... Um, yeah, that's my exhortation for myself. Be a disciple and be kind. Uh, so I'm thankful the Lord is challenging me uh, and helping me in this.